All right, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth McCor, and I'm here in a rainy Caledon this morning as I'm trying to get this video review out, and the rain just started. So, you know, we got to work with what we have, folks. Thanks very much for tuning in to this edition where I have a car review. It's a 2024 Ford Escape plug-in hybrid it's and you know as you folks know there is a there is room for plug-in hybrids for those that don't want to take the full leap to all electric this is a good stopgap measure in my opinion and in fact and i continue to say and you'll probably hear me say it a few times on this episode if you're buying a new vehicle today and there is a plug-in option available for that specific vehicle you're doing yourself a disservice by not buying that plug-in option i'm going to tell you why Oh, and also I want to make sure I thank the uh, OEMs, as I always do, for allowing me the use of the press cards for Ford Canada. Thank you very much. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this review of this Ford Escape. Oh, now, one thing Ford has done is they've been pretty good at slowly electrifying their fleet. And the hybrid, or sorry, the Escape seemed to be a next logical step. You know, obviously they took their iconic F-150, they've taken the iconic Mustang, made it the Mach-E, and of course have electrified other components of their fleets in an HEV capacity. But they have offered a plug-in vehicle version of the Escape, and Escape's a good sized vehicle. It's not one of these big, big, uh, you know, three row or really big SUVs. So it is a more comfortable mid-size, compact to mid-size, I guess. I say compact, but it's, I think it's a really good size of a crossover SUV. Now, there's a lot of history with the Escape, right? Ford has done a lot with this product. They started, uh, brought it out actually in 2000, 2001 as a joint venture with Mazda and you know it was really the first vehicle in 2005 that they offered in their lineup that actually became a, a hybrid uh, HEV vehicle. So they've had some hybrid technology since 2005. Then there was a second gen of this uh, product in 2008 with various differences to, and tweaks and then the third gen Escape came out in 2013 and then the fourth generation which is similar to what we're looking at today came out in 2020 and uh, since then there's been a midlife or mid-gen refresh, whatever you want to call it, in this 2024 version. Uh, actually, last year, it started in 2023 with updated styling and uh, improved technology, standard LED lighting, and over-the-air capability that was added for this uh, mid-2023 refresh. And that's all been carried over into 2024. So as you can see, you know, there's a lot of history with the Escape. Uh, I remember them way back when. And, you know, Ford's been pretty good. Even last year, they sold over 140,000 of these units. Now, that's a mix of all powertrains. It's not just plug-in hybrids. But it goes to show you how important this vehicle is for Ford. So, you know, when they, when they do apply a plug-in version of this at some sort, in this case, a plug-in hybrid version, they do a pretty good job with it. And if we just quickly go over the styling again, it's, it's a nicely styled. I really like some of the changes they done uh, in the 2023 2024 model year i love the led strip out front and the whole led lighting package as i mentioned it has a nice comfortable look but it's not going to pop out it blends in with everything else that's out there to be honest with you uh, you just drive it around in, in the sea of suvs that we have now here in north america and you're just another fish in the pond but you know it does look nice it's got nice styling easy to get in and out good visibility all kinds of stuff it's comfortable so as an overall um, exterior and design package and a vehicle ford's done a pretty good job on it now let's talk about some of the specs so from a specs and powertrain i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this is a plug-in hybrid so it has both a four-cylinder 2.5 liter engine that drives, uh, can drive the wheels and, and send some power to the battery and does multiple things. That's your main workhorse once the battery range runs out. This does have a 10.7 kilowatt hour battery pack to offset that gas. Gives you like something like um, anywhere from 37 miles is the EPA to 59 kilometers if you look at EPA ranges. I've been seeing about 40 in these cooler temperatures, 38 to 43 roughly. So 40 is probably not a bad number to look at all electric range. Takes about 10 and a half hours if you're using the standard wall charger that just comes with it. And that's folks, a charger that you can just plug into any outlet, any, any three prong outlet here in North America. Plug that in. Or, or, or countries that use that uh, electrical standard, and it will trickle charge in about 10 and a half hours and fill up that battery. And that's really kind of one of the strong points of some of these plug-in hybrids is that you don't need to invest in, in a level two charger because it's really not gonna buy you much unless, unless you're doing a lot of uh, trips every day that you think you, could, you should be charging and you have the opportunity to charge, then by all means install a level two because it will juice this up in about three to three and a half hours. So it does make a big difference. Um, however, you, again, you'll get that 40 kilometers back and the, the, the kind of the workflow here is, you know, get up in the truck when you come home or bring the vehicle home, plug it in just like you do your cell phone and stuff. 
let it charge overnight. When you leave, it's going to run in electric only mode first until it depletes the battery and then the engine will kick in. The engine may kick in from time to time if it's extremely cold to help heat the interior and this kind of stuff, but for all intents and purposes, the engine will stay off and you'll run electric until you're done. Then the engine kicks in, you have four or five hundred kilometers of range on a full tank, probably around 550 or so. So a pretty hefty gas tank because uh, it gets pretty good mileage uh, for a vehicle of this class uh, in, in petrol only mode. So you have the assurance of gas if because if you're looking at not looking at all electric that means you're worried about something you don't have confidence and uh, in the battery electric architecture so you get this and it's kind of the almost the best of both worlds you know I'd love to see more all electrics but I get it PHEVs are a stepping stone and a lot of people don't want to make that leap so vehicles like this are a great choice you know in the small good small footprint that's big enough to put some stuff in but easy enough to drive around and comfortable so definitely do that so it has a three and a half kilowatt charger as i mentioned to supply those speeds you know in combination of that battery pack with the small motor and the gas motor pumps out about 200 horsepower depends on what kind of mode and what state it's in but around that 200 horsepower about 155 pound feet of torque so this is not a rocket ship it's not supposed to be a rocket ship it's not going to blow any numbers away it will allow for up to 1500 or pounds or 680 kilos of towing if you want choose to do that you can put a towing package and all that stuff on it uh, because that's what Ford likes to do so that's really the specs on this you know it's a capable vehicle and you know I'm going to run some numbers at the end of the episode and give you some summaries on how that that all kind of meets into a financial savings perspective so let's take more further look at this vehicle so of course SUVs have pretty good cargo capacity and this one's not bad again for its class has a power lift in this option um, when you look at the volume uh, behind the second row, so what you're seeing here, it's about 34.4 cubic feet. Um, with the second row down to make it all flat, uh, it's about 60 liters, so about doubles that space. So it's a pretty good size. You can get a good amount of stuff in. You've got hockey gear, pets, that kind of stuff. That's really what's for Costco shopping. It doesn't really have a, a super huge, don't want to spill my coffee, super huge underneath storage because it has a spare. This has a uh, economy size spare in this because this is based on, a, on an ice vehicle platform that's been electrified, partially electrified, I should say. So you get some of those elements of the internal combustion vehicle that we don't usually see in all electrics, like a spare tire. So it has a spare tire underneath here, so really nothing, not much space to put much under there. What you see is what you get, close the hatch, and off you go. So look at trying to get into the back seat, of course, something I always do. It should be no problem in this. We don't get the 90 degree door opening, but it is a pretty good size. Um, Nice lift up, so pretty easy step up. Got to duck a little bit here, but that's normal for the compact SUV class. Otherwise, you know, I'm about 5'6", and I've got a fistful of headroom, fist and a half, almost two fists of leg room. I have the seat set where I am, so if you're going to be taller, it's going to be a little farther back. But uh, yeah, very comfortable environment. This has the upgraded interior to make it an easy experience for consumers, so not bad in here. All right, let's just go for a quick drive here, give you some of my thoughts. Now, as you're seeing this B-roll on the interior here, as you can see, it's a nicely equipped interior. I've been quite comfortable in here. Got a couple of power front seats, so it's easy to find a supportive position. Uh, the seats are nice and supportive as well. So, you know, good job on Ford. This is, again, a higher end trim with the nice leather et or whatever package, as you can see. And, uh, you know, the center console, there's lots of things going on, lots of uh, storage spaces. It's certainly good enough to put most stuff in and around, so it does the job quite nicely. Um, everything works quite well. HVAC is very nice. The menu system's okay. You know, it's got a 12.3 driver screen and a 13.2 infotainment. Um, the driver screen I like is it gives you lots of different details, but keeps it simple. Info, infotainment is okay. There are some services that I haven't turned on because I haven't set a profile, and some you might have to subscribe for, but it does give you the necessities that you need. You can set charging schedules if you want and stuff. And it does come standard as well with those displays with a 10-speaker B&O um, premium audio system on the plug-in hybrid version. It comes standard, so that's pretty nice. The rear seat as well, as you can see by these uh, B-roll, adequate room you know certainly for four five at a pinch as i always say it's not super huge but it'll certainly get the job done and get you to where you where you need to go in comfort um, right now i'm in all electric mode so as you can hear it's relatively quiet i do have the fan going a little bit because it is raining today as you know and uh, trying to you know get the rain and stuff off the windows and keep it clear but for um for what it does it does quite well i mean again um, this people that have an internal combustion vehicle this isn't really uh, far from it because it is 
still a internal combustion vehicle, just offset with a decent sized battery to get you some all electric range. So, you know, again, I've been very fortunate that I could plug it in every night at my 110, didn't need to use the level two, charge it up and just get that 40, you know, 35 to 45 kilometer range, depending on the, on the, um, uh, on the temperatures. Now, again, I'm going to flash a final slide up. Um, and again, uh, coming up in the closing in the summary, I'm going to run through some financials. And that's really where you see the savings, folks. That's exactly where they see the savings, even at the cost of electricity for home charging electricity. Again, this doesn't have a DC rapid charger, so you're not going to go to a road trip and stop and charge this for 20 minutes. It doesn't have that capability. You're going to just use these in, in places where you can overnight or where you can charge at a level two for three and a half hours or at a tr or using your, the charger that comes with the vehicle in about 10 and a half to 11 hours. So you need to give yourself that much time. So if you're going up to the cottage for the weekend, you can charge it, get a little ga uh, EV mileage on your way up, charged at the cottage, get a little EV mileage on your way down. Or, go, you know, staying in a hotel overnight if it has a, a 110. Usually most hotels will have some sort of external 110, 120, like for block heaters and stuff that you could plug into. That's very common. So you can utilize even hotels for just standard trickle charging when you're there overnight. You don't need to get a hotel that has a level two. So there's lots of options when it comes to saving some fuel. And that's the whole point of plug-in hybrids is to save fuel, to save burning uh, gas, right? Using the electric because it, here in Ontario, it's clean and in most of Canada, it's relatively clean and, and offset. Um, so that's what you want to do, right? Is use that, use that, that functionality. But you know, overall driving impressions, I mean, this is really a really comfortable car. Ford's done a good job making it easy. And that's what I really like is that consumers can just get in here, plug it in every night and not worry about pushing buttons to do this, you know, set, set it once and forget it. And it will deliver the amount of energy from the right source that it needs to, right? And it'll do it as efficiently as possible. And I think that's the key. So uh, driving wise, yeah, suspension's good. You know, if you do go over a lot of uh, bumps, you are gonna get swayed around like this. You know, it's, it's, it's gonna absorb it, but it is gonna toss you a bit, not harshly. Overall, driving experience, comfort is nice. Lots of uh, positions, uh, people that have been in it have found it comfortable. Uh, panoramic roofs, a nice touch if you like that kind of stuff. So they've, they've, equipped, they've equipped this PHAV quite well, and I think people are gonna really like it. All right, so when you run out of uh, your battery charge after utilizing the all EV mode, then the car will, will basically switch into a, a conventional hybrid mode. Well, it'll go back and forth quite a lot. There are modes that you can uh, you can see here. So I have it on EV now, so that means use battery as much as possible. You can put it in auto or EV later, which means that it will conserve the battery to a later time. So I just leave it in EV now and eco in this case. And um, as you can see, oh, I want to get to the power flow here. So this is a good screen to see how the power flow, are. and once I start moving here, you'll see how much that changes. So, you know, right now it's, considering myself in electric driving because I'm stopped, I'm not moving, and it's got some juice in the battery that I'm just running the screens and the, the HVAC system. I've got the fan on, a little bit of heat, that kind of stuff. So it's all coming from the battery. You'll see that when I move, um, it will start to engage the engine and it will go back and forth between hybrid mode and electric driving and the engine coming on to help power the car, the engine turning off, uh, regenerative braking, all these systems that are part of and parcel of um, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles, um, you know, that's the nature of what they do, uh, come into play here. So um, that's why one of the reasons that I say that PHAVs are a good option, they're just a little bit more complex systems that you have to deal with. Now, OEMs are pretty good at making this as automatic and seamless to customers as possible. So, you know, I'm glad that they put these uh, screens on so at least you can see what's going on if you want to, but most people don't care. They just get in and drive, right? Plug it in at night and then drive it and then plug, rinse and repeat, right? So as you can see here, it's, it's, it's shifting depending on acceleration or if I let off the accelerator, it's, uh, it's sending the power to movement of the vehicle uh, and to also uh, putting some power to the battery. If I let off the accelerator now, I'm regenerative braking, so that gets kicked in. As you can see, so there's lots of things going on in drive power, in normal operation, or just drive power. It switches around, as you can see, many times. 
um, while you're driving just on the current uh, state of that the situation that the vehicle's under so I am I am at zero battery so it's got a very minimal battery so that's why it's going to jump around into this mode but the objective is to is to always try to use the battery as much as possible in this mode that way it'll sip as less fuel as possible and of course if the engine's not running then it's not emitting any greenhouse gas emissions emissions either so that's the whole point in some cases it's a combination like in here where the front this is a front wheel drive vehicle so the motor will actually supply power to the front wheel drives sometimes by itself sometimes in conjunction with the battery uh, or sometimes just the battery alone will send uh, power to the front wheel uh, to the motor in the front wheels axles anyway hopefully uh, this information is uh, very helpful so in closing, when we look at the Escape as a very capable plug-in hybrid, again, I'd love to see more battery range, but let's deal with what we have, folks. And what I always try to do is I try to run the numbers just to see, is this something that's really going to benefit people, you know, by choosing that? Because typically PHEVs will cost more than their their trim a counterpart that's a let that's gasoline only so looked at some pricing on ford canada looked at some of the numbers and some of the trim packages to find something that's closest related to the plug-in hybrid version because it really it really is kind of one option and you pick your colors and some other some other options that you can add on but for all intents and purposes it comes fairly well equipped at that price point that they base that at so the base price for the plug-in hybrid version of the Escape is $46,999. And I guess the birds maybe don't like that. Maybe they do, because they seem to want to squawk at me today, but that's okay. I'll talk over them. So that's what that price is. Now remember, in looking this up, it does qualify for the $5,000 federal incentive. If I look at the base MSRP of an Escape, it's about $34,000. That's for the a trim that doesn't have as many options as this has, as this comes with at the, the base price that it comes with. So if I were to just ignore that fact and say, no, I just want the cheapest model, I don't care, about $34,000. If you were to buy that, add your tax, there's no incentive or anything, obviously, then you're looking at about a $10,000 difference in price from that, that base base entry level one that is not as well equipped as this one is, even without options. Um, so about 10K. And I was able to calculate that about $18,000 a year, 18, excuse me, 18,000 kilometers a year of driving. You can convert that to miles. Um, you would save about $1,500 to $2,000 a year in fuel versus uh, in just an ICE vehicle versus the plug-in hybrid. And I've got lots of math, which I'm not going to whiteboard and explain out here because it just gets, if you want to know what I did, you can send me an email and, and we can have a conversation. So if I were to buy that base one at 10K over, I'm, I'm, I'm about five, five to six years, let's say four to six years before I recoup that money back that I spent on that, on the PHEV version versus the base, base ICE version so hopefully you're following me I haven't lost you however if I compare apple to apples to apples and this is a nice red apple color if I look at the platinum version of the uh, the escape the ice version and general combustion version which is a, a very similar trim and outfitted as this one is at that base price it's only about three thousand dollars less than uh, the plug-in hybrid so right away then but don't forget you get the five thousand dollar incentive off on the escape so even with adding some taxes and stuff you're getting about three thousand dollars net off of this so that's kind of where it looks so it ends up to be about the same price as the internal combustion version and to me folks that's a no-brainer if i'm going to say fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a year or a thousand to two thousand dollars a year simply by just plugging it in every night like i do my iphone or my uh, samsung phone or whatever android phone my tablets just with a 110 and driving it every day and just doing that every day not, not even worrying about workplace charging and finding a charger at the mall or any of that stuff because those are bonuses if you can have that in the same time i'm just looking at charging it once a day overnight that's all i'm, I'm talking about you can save 1500 to 2000 dollars a year just by doing that so my question to you is why wouldn't you want to do that why wouldn't you want to get something that will save you money right from the get-go and help lower emissions because when you're running in electric only mode there are no emissions coming out of this it's only when the engine kicks in and then when the engine kicks in you get pretty good fuel mileage because of that hybrid version so in conclusion after all that rambling is this a recommended vehicle well absolutely you know it's got enough range to make an impact 
So as you can see here quickly, the range that I did was just about 207 kilometers in the few days that I had it. About 186 were all electric. So you can see about 90% of my driving range was done in all electric. Uh, and that's just going back and forth to work and doing errands, as I mentioned earlier in the video. So plugging it in every night in a 110, letting it charge overnight, and utilizing that all-electric range to the advantage that I had. You, you can see I hardly used any gas, um, not even uh, a quarter tank, uh, not even probably about an eighth of a tank, if that, um, because it wasn't very much, showing 1.4 liters per 100 kilometers for fuel. Extremely low. So this is really where your savings are, folks, if you're doing this as a practice. And a very high percentage of it was in all electric driving, just normal driving. Now, if I'm going to do long highway trips, it's going to skew the other way. So you do need to look at your use case. So about 80, 90 percent of it all electric. Then why wouldn't you? Because a your your tank of gas is going to last you weeks versus days <laughs> normally, and uh, and you're going to save money. So folks, you know, and then you get those inherent. Uh, emission stand, uh, lowering just as, as an offshoot, uh, which is really, really nice to have. So I'm um, hopefully that I've explained that well because uh, I'm very passionate about trying to make this as real for, for people as possible and show you the reality. So when people say plug-in hybrids don't save you money or they're crap for the environment, whatever, it's not true. You just need to run the numbers. For your use case, it might not save you enough money to justify it. And I get that. So you need to run the numbers. But I'm just showing you what what it looks like in a normal kind of a, a, an average use case. In conclusion, absolutely recommended vehicle. I think Ford's done a really good job to give you a much better experience, uh, lower fuel prices, better range on the battery, and better lower emissions. So that all makes sense. So well done Ford on this. You know, I think it's a very capable vehicle. I hope they come out with some uh, all electric versions of this type of size. Uh, I think something even a little smaller than this would be nice uh, in an all electric capacity. We'll see, you know, Ford's saying they're all in over time. <laughs> the time keeps changing, but uh, let's see how they work. So well done and certainly uh, a recommended vehicle. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Make sure there's nothing here in the charge port up front. I like that. Hope you enjoyed this episode on the 2024 Ford Escape plug-in hybrid version. Uh, again, thanks Ford Canada for allowing me the use of this vehicle for a few days, even in the rain and the snow and crazy weather we've had this week. It's just been a roller coaster, folks. But hey, we love it. This is Canada. I love it. Bring it on, I say. Bring it on. Anyway, if you have any questions, all my contact information is coming up. Email me, right? Throw comments in there. But if you've got a deep question, I'm not going to spend time on the comments and, and write 10 paragraphs of response. you got something that you want to talk to me about, email me. Let's set up a phone call. Let's have a conversation because that's what I'm here for. I'm not afraid to answer questions and to uh, to uh, rebuttal any FUD that's out there. I could be wrong and we could have a discussion and I could realize that I'm wrong in what I'm thinking. And I'd love to understand that because I'm very open-minded. So I encourage you to reach out to me. Let's set up a call if you want. If you have further questions on anything that I do, on any of the vehicles that I reviewed and what's going on in the marketplace, because it is still an exciting marketplace. Uh, contrary to what the press is telling you, EV sales have not tanked. In, in fact, they're doing quite the opposite. They continue to grow at double digit growth rates which is faster than the internal combustion market is growing. In fact, it's declining a bit year over year. And it's still a big market, but EVs are slowly there. Just gonna take a little longer than everybody thinks. And I've been saying that since day one. This whole transition is decades, folks. It's not a five year, 10 year, 15 year. It's not 2030, 2035, 2040. There's no more ICE fees. That's that isn't the way it works. Internal combustion vehicles are gonna be around for decades but we just need to make that transition as soon, as, as quick as we possibly can with all the factors taking into account in order to try to make a difference in climate change because this is something that consumers have direct control over and it does make a big difference. 20% of greenhouse gas emissions are consumer related transportation. So you are making a difference. So thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and until the next episode, I'll get off my soapbox here and say thank you very much and I'll see you when I see you.